do. Recording okay? Good. Perfect. So again, my name is uh, Bernard Lam, and uh, I'm going to be responsible for the first couple of modules this morning, and uh, probably into the uh, late uh, mid-afternoon. Uh, first of all, I apologize. Actually, I'm just recovering from a cold, so I kind of sounds a little bit kind of uh, odd in my voice, uh, but um, I hope that I can make it through. Um, the one thing is actually my part will be a lot of uh, information. So uh, I think those slides already are on your website. So uh, no need to kind of take notes. I think you should be able to get all those information up there. Um, so to make um, this uh, first kind of boring section, uh, like, you know, with all the information uh, 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 interesting, I think that I, I encourage everyone to actually ask questions. So feel free to stop me in the middle of the, uh, of the presentation and ask any question uh, that is needed, okay? Right, so um, module one, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the bigger picture. What's the current uh, state of uh, next generation sequencing? What kind of technologies out there? And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a little background, uh, some of the history, where actually and 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 where we get to right now, actually on next gen sequencing. And now I'll actually take a few um, major platform uh, to discuss. Uh, the main one that you may have learned a lot or heard a lot is Illumina. But I'll also actually talk a little bit about other technologies, including uh, Thermo Fisher's Ion Torrent, um, some of the long reads application from Oxford Nanopore and Pack Bio, and also some of the newer one that uh, is coming along that you may not heard a lot, but it may have a potential that five and five to ten years from now it may become a major force in uh, the research. And finally, because you guys are all pathologists, I will also want to kind of link these technology to what you may do um, in, um, in, in kind of your work, okay? All right. So how far have we advanced in genomics? So I think just to get everyone wake up, maybe I'll ask everyone a question. Um, anyone remember when was the first human genome was sequenced? And to follow up quite that question is, uh, how long did it take and how much did it cost to sequence the first human genome? Feel free to yell some answers. Sorry? Yeah, you can speculate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Give a guess. Mm-hmm. Around that, yep. In that range, in that in that order of magnitude, I would say yes, billions of dollars. In what currency? <laughs> okay, anyone want to dispute that? Sorry, maybe millions. Again, what currency? Canadians. Okay, all right, all right. Well, um, let's see. Oh, both of you are quite close. All right. So um, I don't know if any one of you were born after the first human genome. Um, I was definitely uh, born way before the first human genome was sequenced. In fact, actually, I was. Another surprising fact for myself, I was a plant biologist. And I was actually I was actually doing the parallel work of looking up actually how the plant genomes get sequenced. And, um, and the interesting thing is at the same time, actually, human actually gets sequenced. So this is actually, if you look at the, uh, the page here, this is actually the... Um, the first human genome uh, publication um, in Nature and Science. It actually started actually in 1990 and completed in April 20, uh, 2003. So you are very, very actually uh, uh, spot on. It does take actually like say, almost like 13 years to do that. It is actually a NIH um, uh, supported uh, research with a lot of international uh, institutes also joining force to uh, do that. So if you look at actually the um, second, um, uh, the 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 second uh, diagram here, this is actually a kind of like a factory of these uh, old um, uh, sequencer that was used to sequence it. And, and you actually imagine there is actually like say 20 plus institute with the same kind of instrumentation to sequence that one single human genome. It ended up causing actually about $2.7 billion to do that. And the technology that was being used was uh, Sanger sequencing. So I'll, I'll get a little bit more to that. Now, to kind of actually, maybe actually the, la the last question I'll ask before the next slide is, uh, how long would it take now for a human genome to get sequenced? Maybe as little as a day. So 
Uh, so yeah, this is actually the uh, current uh, state. It, it, it actually takes less than probably like between a day to less than a day to sequence a human genome. And the cost is basically around a hundred to a thousand dollars. And um, as you see here, uh, that there is a number of different vendors. Now there's a lot of different instruments that you can do that from the large, big instruments. Some of those actually will see that today and to the little one that actually could plug into your laptop. Those can also sequence human genome. And, and so you can see that the changes, um, it's kind of like you look at the Moore's laws is that you definitely have a big drop in both actually the variability of sequence available, but also the price um, of the sequencing is definitely uh, coming down quite a bit. So we're in that age that like really um, uh, sequencing is becoming more and more of our daily uh, work that very, very important for our, our use. So coming back to the first human genome, um, the chemistry that is used was what we call chain termination. So if you look at the diagram here, is that our normal building block, our DNA, is the deoxynucleotide, which is the first, uh, the, 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 the base at the bottom of, uh, of the left hand. It has the OH group, a hydroxy group. And the hydroxy group is pretty important because it is used to form with the phosphate group of the next nucleotide to form the backbone phosphodiester bond of uh, a, a DNA or RNA molecule. So the way the chain termination does is that they use another nucleotide called the dideoxy nucleotide, which is basically losing that hydroxy group. And that actually would literally cannot allow the uh, uh, polymer polymerization to uh, continue and stop the, the chain from growing. Okay. So the way that it works is that you can have a DNA molecule and then you add the DNA polymerase, the NTPs and the dideoxy uh, NTPs to that. And these dideoxy NTPs can be either radioactively or fluorescently labeled. And the way that it does is that it would stop the uh, polymerization of DNA uh, synthesis at various points randomly. And you build actually a ladder of the DNA of different sizes. And the end could be either labeled by a radioisotope or fluorescent isotope. And now what you can do is you can run it on the gel. So you can see here is an old um, uh, X-ray film that I think you, when you take the uh, molecular biology course, you probably see those. Or you can run it actually on a fluorescence uh, based gel, or even actually there is a there is an instrument that can detect these peak. And so you can run all of them, um, one trip, one samples, all different all different four colors of the bases on the same lane and um, and, and detect them because you can uh, put a uh, different uh, laser um, to, to kind of detect that, or you actually have to run it on the gel that you, you have to kind of read it through every single one of the uh, other lane. All right. So how does that actually link to uh, next-gen sequencing? So if you think about your human DNA, your human DNA is about three, three billion bases, you, you, to actually sequence that, it takes uh, the effort of, first of all, you need to break down the human DNA. And so for one sample, you make break into multiple fragments. And at the age of the first human genome during Sanger sequencing, what you need to do is that each of those fragments, you kind of have to um, make more copies to make it detectable. The way that they did is they actually grow it on a petri dish. So they clone them and actually grow them in bacteria and grow them. So one fragment basically becomes one clone. And then each of the clone, you go through a Sanger sequencing through the uh, uh, chain termination uh, sequencing. And then one of those reactions will give you one read or what we call one fragment, okay? Now in the next gen sequencing, what we are doing here is that right now is you have a DNA, you, if your DNA, you break them down into, into small fragments. And now what you do is you kind of clone that by more or less amplification in the same tube. So all the fragments of your same DNA are basically amplified in the same tube. Um, through multiple um, uh, 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 chemistry, including adapters and indexes, which I would go through a little bit more in details today. And now what you can do is that you can also put multiple samples now combined together into a single sequencing pool. So the way that it does is then multiple reads for multiple fragments from multiple samples can be sequenced at the same time. So this is actually why next-gen sequencing is also called massive parallel sequencing, because the fact that 
of molecular barcoding and all the other things that you can do to amplify all these fragments and sequence them together. You can do everything together at the same time at a much efficient, efficient and cost actually efficient way. All right, so kind of go back a little bit to history. So uh, I kind of mentioned that the uh, Sanger sequencing was the first sequencing um, uh, uh, effort uh, on human genome. And around 2003, the first human genome is completed. So now when NGS um, uh, uh, technology came up, it's actually roughly around slightly after the uh, first human genome. Um, again, this is a slide that can be pretty compli um, complicated with a lot of um, history in there. And, and I'm just going to go through it in a bit like, you know, uh, 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 overview. But if you would like to talk a little bit more, definitely have Pete to talk during the break, break about that. So the first, first um, uh, the next generation sequence, sequencing has, at the beginning, there's actually a number of um, um, technology that they were, they were kind of um, um, are tackling that, including um, a company called Selexa, which becomes actually pretty important later on. But also some of the, um, the big company that you may already know, like say Roche 454, um, apply bio system solid and life technologies enter. And so these are all those early kind of technologies to start looking into next generation sequencing. I'll go into a little bit more detail how each of them works. But the one very important thing at that time is around 2007 company Illumina, who was, which was at, the big, at that time a um, uh, microarray company. So their, 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 their business was mainly microarray. They bought actually Selexa, and they bought actually this uh, a sequence by synthesis uh, uh, chemistry. And that really changed the whole landscape of next generation sequencing. Because in the next few years, what Illumina has done is really commercialize next generation sequencing instrument, including the first um, uh, kind of benchtop um, uh, uh, instrument called MySeq, which is basically for a, a smaller output, but available actually for put in any lab to a big production scale um, instrument called high seq which can actually sequence at the production scale of multiple human genome at the same time. And then eventually also actually put in a mid-range uh, next seq available. And at that time also, um, the kind of like the, what you call the third, gen third generation sequencing instrument uh, from a company called PacBio is also coming up. That's actually a, a single molecule um, uh, sequencing company, but also it is actually for long read sequencing. So the other thing that, that may have happened and did not happen that might also change is that at that time, actually, Roche also actually uh, put in a bid to buy Illumina and Illumina refused to uh, get bought. And, and if you can't see where Illumina is right now, I think that was a pretty good actually decision back then. So again, in uh, 2015, you start seeing actually the first generation, third generation sequencing instruments coming up. And these are from Oswald Nanopore Pack Bio. These are single molecule uh, um, sequencing instrument and they are really actually for long reads. Uh, the other thing that may be interesting for you is this is actually where uh, also personalized medicine starting to take shape. So Illumina started at uh, a company called Grail. I'm pretty sure some of you may have heard about that. I'm not going to go too deep into those, but uh, just actually be aware of that. If you see now, over time now, things actually really exploded in the last, say, decade. So now you can see that even Illumina itself has gone through a few different um, uh, uh, generations, including like multiple different version of the NovaSeq. And there's actually additional companies coming up, PacBio with a big instrument, and then some of the newer vendor called Element Bio and Optimer, uh, which basically have some competitor products against uh, things like Illumina. Um, but I'll go for a little bit more on that. But for you to think about that, sequencing is a little bit like iPhone. So basically every few, few years, they change their, uh, their, their chemistry and they change actually a little bit how, how the um, instrument looks. But as you can see, comparing to the first generation of the iPhone versus actually now what, like iPhone 16, we're getting better and better a lot of things. You want to take a big, big, uh, better picture? Yeah, definitely. It's the same thing actually for human genome. It's like, you know, you can, you can get a lot of actually things now of the, the new generation of sequencing. But also the same thing you can think about is that in iPhone, you have a lot of different apps. It's the same thing for sequencing. As the instrument begin to evolve, more and more application is available. And all of the time, these applications are not developed just by the uh, company that generate the instrument, but also by other uh, 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 party that generate those. Okay, any questions so far? All right. 
there some water. So why you want to do genomics? So if you think about it, especially us as a cancer researcher, there's a lot of things that you can see actually. Cancer genome really actually kind of explains it all. First of all, you may have actually, let's say, a pre-existing uh, condition in your germline. So you kind of have kind of, Family background, um, you know, um, some of your HLA and and even actually your sensitivity to uh, drugs that really can can actually dictate, you know, some of the things that you do. And, and actually, using genomics definitely would help. And also, actually, when you actually get actually, uh, if you do have the cancer, there's a lot of somatic process that you actually want to look at, including looking at drive mutations, any chromosomal ab aberration, and also mutations mutational processes. But specifically, and I think that this will be in the second half of this course that. Some of the things that you may be looking at is things like, you know, um, somatic single nucleotide variants, SNVs, um, copy number variations, structural variants, in the RNA world, the transcript fusions, um, immune expression, and then also the modification of DNA, including epigenetics, such as actual methylome and protein DNA interaction. So kind of put you back now to the big picture of why we are here today talking about that. So it's really actually kind of drilled down to this one single slide here, which is why we're doing this, especially for patients, whether you're cancer patients or patients with a, a disease, is that I love you kind of as uh, mainly focus on the left-hand side of the slide, which is you are looking at the tissue, you may be looking at actually the blood samples mm -hmm. and looking at different kind of um, clinical kind of uh, characteristic of your patient samples. But you can actually apply your, your samples to kind of get more information from the genomic side and help of the patients by, first of all, you actually have to do extraction of DNA and RNA from, from samples. And then after that, you go into the process of sequencing. And the process of sequencing is kind of like this four slide in the middle, where you actually, first of all, need to convert your DNA into a library. And then from then on, go through um, a kind of a square B and C of the sequencing part. And then lastly, I should do the bioinformatics of aligning and, and data analysis. Now that's usually now like, you know, in the, in the kind of like the last decade or so, what people are focusing on is generating a lot of those data, going it for our, our basic um, our, 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 our research and analysis. But more importantly is that now, especially like say what we're doing here at OICR is that we're trying to go in beyond that. We really want to apply it to patients. So what you can do is now, and actually Ian is going to talk a little bit more about is how to interpret the data at a clinical level to finally generate it on the right-hand side, a clinical report that you can give it back to the doctors or the patients to kind of look at that and actually kind of match them to a particular um, uh, a therapy or treatment, okay? So I'm going to go over a little bit more on these information throughout the talk. If I also, um, and, and at the moment, what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about the technology. And then we're going to talk into the kind of like the more molecular side later on in the second section. So quickly go through the, um, the, the um, quickly go through the uh, platform. So there is, again, kind of like a bunch of track from years. I'm not gonna go through every single one of them, but try to draw you up, you know, the first four, uh, Roche, Solid, Illumina, and Iron Toran was kind of like the first generation, next generation sequencing. As you can see, most of them are short read sequencing versus the uh, third generation PacBio and Oxford Nanocore are the long read sequencing. And each of them kind of have their own way of uh, um, sequencing, uh, especially in the, uh, in the third generation, as you notice, they are, really not amplifying the DNA, it's really sequencing directly the DNA. Versus the short read, they, you do actually have to kind of clonally amplify your, your DNA so that you can actually get enough signal to get sequenced. Each of them that has their own kind of technology, I'll go over them a little bit more in details, but this is actually just an overview of the um, uh, um, uh, technologies. So um, first, first one, Illumina. So I'm going to let you guys actually watch a video and that actually will give you a sense of actually how this uh, technology goes. Oh, I think the link is lost in here. So yeah, I need to probably go through. I think actually what we will do, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Any questions so far?
Newton's fundamentals the first time all of us. Clustering is a process where you describe the molecule in multiple different dimensions. Fluorescent and pack nucleotides can be used for addition to the growing chain. And then one is incorporated. Simultaneously, hundreds of millions of clusters are sequenced from the recently born clusters. Just so I go back to the slide. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining today. Uh, my name is Kelly, and I'll be guiding us through a discussion of the concept and the human sequencing data analysis. Yeah. Uh, the talk is an intro to the general concepts that can be applied to the screen. Okay. 
Perfect. So a um, couple of things I should take, take away is that, again, number one is that you're sequencing your DNA fragments and each of them are present in a very, very small quantity. And so the first thing first, as you see, is you need to first um, kind of clonally amplify them, the same, same um, fragments. And then you can see that that's actually through the, the bridge amplification. And then again, you'll hear a lot of this word of uh, sequencing by synthesis. So what you do is you create a template and then you add one base at a time. So one cycle is one base at a time. And each of the base are fluorescently uh, labeled. And you can actually be able to use imaging to kind of detect the color of each of the base added. And that's actually where you record them kind of onto your hard drive and continue for each cycle when you actually start continuous synthesis, uh, synthesize a, a DNA fragment. So this is the type of a, a, um, a technology with Illumina. And, um, and the one thing actually to think about is that Illumina currently is own almost like 80%, still only actually 80% of the market. And in fact, you like to more or less like 95% of the clinical uh, genomics. And uh, though they, they do provide a lot of wide range of applications and um, they do have some FDA approved instrument also. So again, you know, I'm not trying to be a, uh, trying to sell Illumina, but this is basically the, uh, the most used instrument around. And this slide kind of show actually the progression of Illumina technology over the years from more or less like say 2007, which is basically the first uh, instrument they bought from uh, Selexa all the way to the, the newest one, uh, the, the, the Novus X Plus. What you kind of see is that, um, you know, the throughput is increasingly uh, a ridiculous increase um, in terms of size. Actually, you go from the first one, can only sequence one human genome in 14 days to the Novus X Plus, you literally can sequence 130 genomes within 48 hours. So I think that's the take home message I really want you to kind of think about. And um, and and they they do, I mean, the other thing you want to take a look at is the cost of the um, sequencing. Um, it went from, at the, in the first production scale uh, instrument high seek, it was around $6,000 actually a genome, to now in the X Plus, you literally can actually be paying around 200 US uh, for a human genome at 30 eggs, actually. So not going to go through all the other details, but, oh, okay, yeah, question. The sequencing, the sequencing cost. So this is actually the amount of, um, like, you know, the, 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 the cost that you need to spend on the sequencing reagents. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep, they, you do actually because uh, you do have um, other costs in, in terms of library preparation, uh, tissue extraction for DNA RNA, and uh, also actually uh, informatics analysis too. So, so all in all, actually, like I say, when you hear people kind of talk about two hundred dollars sequencing, is really a lot of the time is is actually the, um, the the just the sequencing cost. But you do you do now trying to again, there's a lot of things that you can do to try to drive down the overall price actually. But the, at the end of the day. Um, and, and you will see some of the things I talk about is that, like, you know, not just, you know, um, a lot of time your cost is human hands and, you know, how you can actually automate uh, these processes is also actually pretty important for that. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, that's a very that's a very good question, actually. So, um, actually, if you look at the uh, MySeq, it was actually uh, the MySeq here on the left hand side, twenty eleven. It's still used. You you will see that actually in in my lab uh, later on in the day. I still like that. It's actually it's one of the most uh, trustworthy one. They just came out with actually um, after like almost like twelve years. They actually for uh, thirteen years they came out with the next version of MySeq. I actually want to start a petition to just say you know I I don't want it to be out to actually. So, uh, but again, um, it does actually it seems to seems to me that they are starting to kind of have more and more instrument, um, more because that the market is evolving very, very quickly. There's actually a lot of different, um, you will see later on in the talk, there's a lot of competitors too. So they kind of have to come up with actually the, um, it's kind of like iPhone, you need to really actually get, get to the front in terms of technology development. 
um, and address actually the, the most important um, um, uh, needs. So right now, I think that the main driver is really the cost of the sequencing, because you really want, like, you know, we, we I think we've done enough sequencing, 100,000 genomes. It's actually really application. And this is actually why you guys are here also, is actually really want to apply and just to real, real patient, not no longer actually just collecting data and so and, and then analyze them. So, so I think that that's really kind of driver of this uh, system that that um at, that that they might actually come a little bit more, but more importantly, actually kind of price coming down a little bit. All right. The other thing actually you want to see is actually over time there is actually a different platform too. So that the production scale is where actually I put the price on that. Um, the 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 high seek the Nova seek are really actually what you call the production scale where you can sequence large number of genomes with a low cost. And then you have others such as actually the next seek is more actually like say for maybe mid-sized lab that may not be, because each of these instruments, like say the Novus X Plus right now is almost actually $2 million Canadian per instrument. Not every single lab could afford that. And uh, some like, you know, a, a mid-sized like a next seek 2000 is around like half a million. At least actually some of the lab or even the smaller company can be able to afford that. So it's kind of like, all those market segments they want to cover also. All right, I'm going to quickly go through some of the library workflow. Just bear with me on this one. I'm going to kind of go through very quick. I will come back in the afternoon to give you a little bit more kind of like the idea at the molecular level. So here's actually just an overview of each of the uh, library workflow. So the main usage, of course, for next-gen sequencing is sequence your whole genome. So you start off with your genomic DNA. And because this is a short read sequencing, first of all, you need to break down your DNA into small pieces. You can either do a fragmentation or enzymatic digestion to get your DNA down to a smaller, smaller fragments. Usually we try to get down to around uh, 300 base pair. After that, because you're breaking down the DNA, you need to do the end repair of the DNA. And then you also want to make it ready for um, ligation, which is um, doing a telling and then ad adding A to the end of the the. The, uh, the DNA fragment, and then so that it can actually adapt, like uh, uh, the uh, uh, ligate the adapters to that. After that, you do a limited cycles of PCR, where you could actually be able to amplify them and also act index actually to that. So this is actually a really common PR, uh, whole genome workflow, what we call PCR plus uh, whole genome library prep. Now there are other ways of doing this too. There are cases where, um, especially um, uh, um, for germline uh, uh, application, you, you would kind of um, avoid doing, doing amplification. So you got the same protocol, uh, fragmented DNA and repair A telling, and then you just adapt the, uh, the, the uh, uh, ligate adapter directly to them without further PCR. The only problem is that, is that now you actually you have to start with a lot more DNA because the PCR in the PCR plus protocol will really kind of get you from a small amount of DNA all the way to like a little bit more de detectable DNA that you can use. So in the case actually of the PCR free whole genome library prep, you have to start with much more DNA so that you can actually be able to get enough DNA for sequencing. <clears throat> There's another uh, uh, method uh, which I'm not going to go into in this talk, happy to actually discuss it uh, outside, is uh, through what we call a, a tegmentation. So you can actually use transposome um, and, and, and what in the process is that uh, the transposome could cleave the intact DNA and also add, uh, add the adapter at the same time and, and then carry on the process with PCR. You can use a tegmentation uh, WGS library. This is mainly an Illumina owned protocol. So kind of think about the input. Uh, PCR plus, you can go from as little as one nanogram of DNA uh, to a thousand nanogram. But PCR free, you really need to start with a much larger amount, minimum actually at least 200 nanograms. Mm -hmm. in, in any method, you will actually do that. And so, um, but also actually, like I said, you may be just sequencing the same part of the genome or the same copy of the genome. So we'll come back a little bit later on that, that there is actually some kind of method that we can also try to mitigate that. For example, adding uh, what we call a, a unit molecular um, uh, uh, um, barcode that actually that you can, what we call UMI, that actually we can actually be able to kind of um, uh, look at how efficient the, uh, the ligation is. Because ligation is definitely not the most efficient chemistry too. So every kit is basically what they're trying to do is actually improve that over time. 
<clears throat> so whole genome usually is what we do, but also you can kind of look into, let's say you say, I don't need the whole genome information. I only uh, kind of curious on all the major cancer drivers genes. And so what you can do is instead of spending all of your kind of uh, money on sequencing on the whole genome, you may focus on specific sets of genes. So this is what we call targeted sequencing. It's actually pretty simple compared, uh, 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 you know, it, it's, a, it's a long procedure, but it's actually pretty simple. If you look at the overall structure, you literally actually on the left-hand side have to create a, what we call a whole genome library, just the same as the previous slide. And then from the whole genome library, you can actually now enrich the, um, the kind of uh, uh, genes that you're interested. What you do is you do use a target capture using single-stranded single DNA oligoprops. They is specifically designed um, to the genes of your interest, gene or genes of your interest. And then you use that to fish out the libraries from the whole genomes uh, library pool. And that's you have the capture libraries and you can actually do the target uh, sequencing library. So that's that. It sounds actually process wise pretty easy. It does take a little bit longer time. So kind of think about actually what you can do is you can do actually either like say, I want to focus on just the whole exome, which if you compare to a human genome of three uh, gigabases, is around only like say 50 megabases. You want to look at the inherited disease, it's around 11 megabases. And then if you just want to look at cancer genes, you usually say around one megabase. So you now kind of really focus on what you want to study in a very small space. What you can do is now you can either spend less on your sequencing, but also at the same time, you can actually sequence much deeper as you need, especially if you want to look for kind of low level uh, variant. <clears throat> There's the other alternative approach. Um, you, you could also try to do is you can do a PCR amplicon base. So you, you'll start, you, you still start with genomics DNA, but you now um, target your, directly target your gene of interest by a, designing a set of primers against these regions. And actually these primers usually is flanked by the adaptive sequence. It's usually quite um, uh, uh, useful, especially for anything that's low abundance. And also, it kind of address kind of your, your question of, uh, am I going to lose actually genomics? Is that actually, is that this is actually one of those cases that let's say you have a poor quality samples or low abundance actually uh, transcript, you go straight to do a piece of the amplify instead of actually like say, doing actually the whole genome side. So that's another kind of approach to do that too. So I'll come back a little bit on that. Um, in the Antoran, one of those um, uh, approved panel called Oncomine is uh, using these type of specific uh, technologies. So they had the time, but we're still okay. Um, so, um, and then lastly is RNA, uh, whole transcriptome. So now human, human like any whole transcriptome basically have a lot of um, housekeeping RNA that you may not be interested in studying. So for example, ribosomal RNA um, is literally actually 80% of your whole transcriptome. So what you really want to do is kind of focus on uh, studying your kind of gene, like your, your transcript of interest. So there's a couple of approach. Um, first one is if you're only interested in the protein coding transcript, you can actually um, enrich the um, poly A uh, RNA through a uh, oligo DET beats capture. So that's a simple kind of uh, one step binding um, uh, capture of your coding RNA. Alternatively, what you can do is you can deplete the ribosomal RNA. So you can use probes to bind the ribosomal RNA and digest them out of your um, RNA samples. So that's actually what, what we call the whole transcriptome because it does include all the um, non-coding transcript also in, in, the, in the analysis. They do share the same actually downstream uh, uh, process. So once you enrich your mRNA or RNA-dependent RNA, RNA, RNA uh, you do a fragmentation. And this time actually you do a heat, like RNA is much more labor, so you could do a heat uh, fragmentation. You get a fragmented RNA, again, to the same, uh, around the size of short read, around two to 300 base, uh, nucleotides. And then you go for a cDNA synthesis, remove, uh, remove of the original RNA, and then generate actually, like I said, double-stranded DNA. And then same thing now, like actually your whole genomes, uh, library prep, you add adapter, and then you piece out, you get your uh, whole transcriptome libraries. Again, I'll come back, I should give a little bit more molecular detail in the, afternoon, uh, in, in the next uh, section. A uh, couple of um, uh, 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 the next two to three slides is really kind of like, you know, kind of go through some of the other applications. So the whole genome and transcriptome and the target is kind of like 
the 80% of what most people do. But again, we are moving to the world of multi-omics. So when you think about actually our genomics is just beyond just the um, ATCG in, in your genome. So one of the, one of the main ones that, that people are doing a lot is actually what we call methylomes and epigenetics. I'm going to give you a, some introduction information on these um, without going into too much detail, but again, happy to discuss it uh, in, in the break. So first of all is um, methylation. So it's basically having a methyl group on the DNA and you want to detect that. So the traditional method is actually through the bisulfide sequencing. So if you actually have a look at the, uh, the, the diagram here, your DNA may be methylated um, either through the uh, 5-MC, 5-methylcytosine, or 5-hydroxy um, uh, methylcytosine, 5-HMC, um, usually on a, around a CPG island. And what you can do with bisulfide sequencing is that this methyl methylation is kind of added as a protector of your DNA. So, so during a bisulfide um, uh, a conversion, what bisulfide does is that it would convert a cytosine, an unprotected cytosine, to a uracil. So if you are protected, you won't get worked on by the um, uh, uh, bisulfide. But if you are unprotected in, uh, 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 in, in the case here, what you convert is you, you, the C will convert to the U. So now when you sequence it, you got to look for those sequences that in, you know, compared to your kind of reference sequence that, that basically have, um, a, you know, suppose you're supposed to get a C, you get a T. You know that those are, those are actually, let's like, say, the um, unprotected um, uh, uh, cytosine. And then those actually that is actually remaining a C is your, um, is your protected uh, 5MC or 5HMC. Uh, uh, cytosine. There's uh, other alternative method to do that, uh, for example, with an enzymatic uh, methyl C. So what you do is the same thing. You protect by, um, you protect the, um, uh, uh, the methyl group actually with the uh, TET oxidation, and then you, you apply an enzyme called ABOMAC to kind of convert actually and protect the C to a uh, U. There is actually also a, a more, so these two actual methods are really at the single nucleotide level. So you can actually really kind of look at which specific uh, basis is being methylated. Alternatively, there is a method called um, MEDIP, so which is a methylated DNA precipitation uh, sequencing. What you can do is you can use a anti-5MC uh, antibodies to enrich the uh, DNA, but it does actually not really, it really actually kind of um, uh, precipitate out a region of highly uh, 5-MC uh, rich region, but not really a specific base. So it's kind of one thing that you have to kind of think about. <clears throat> of course, with, with epigenetics, it's not just methylation. You also have actually like the interaction actually with a uh, protein. So you can also do uh, things like uh, chromatin imitation, imitation precipitation sequencing, CHIP-seq. This is actually what you do is identifying um, um, DNA binding sites for transcription factor or DNA binding protein. The way that you do is actually pretty simple, is that you cross-link your DNA samples, which is cross-linking your uh, DNA with uh, uh, the, the protein that's interacting with. And then what you do is you use the antibodies uh, specifically against your protein of interest and precipitate the, the uh, DNA protein complex. And then you continue to library prep and be able to find actually the sequence that the peak that your DNA is bound to. And the last thing is uh, what we call the attack C. So this is actually really looking for open area of your genome. So what you do is you take your intact genome, usually from a nuclei, and then, um, and then um, use a specific uh, type of uh, transposase, TN5, to tag the, um, anything that's open, not protected by histone, and then add the adapter there. And you can sequence those open regions and be able to kind of figure out what is the region that is more accessible for your protein of interest. <clears throat> the last slide for other things that Illumina uh, can kind of uh, sequencing can actually help you is, uh, and again, these are things that I may not go into much details, um, include a lot of the single cell technologies. This actually probably can be like a whole class actually on that, including actually studying single cell level, um, three prime or five prime RNA-seq, ataxy, and even T cell receptor. And kind of like if you want to kind of look a little bit more into details, kind of think about the major vendor for that. The, the one major company is, of course, is Penix Genomics. But there's, as you notice, there's actually more and more different companies that is uh, coming up with that, including like Pars, Scale, and then recently Illumina actually bought a company called Fluent Bio. 
There's also things like spatial transcriptomics. So this is really actually at the kind of like your kind of a, a tissue level. And uh, what, what you can do is you can barcode hybridization probes and detect your RNA transcript on the slide and through imaging. And then, uh, and then kind of uh, retrieve these uh, probes um, that's bound to the, uh, your, your, your RNA of interest and then use the uh, instrument, Illumin instrument as a counter. So these are things, uh, are companies like uh, Tennis Genomics and NanoString actually have uh, technologies in them. Similarly, you can do the same thing actually of protein. You can actually try to bind protein, like use probes to bind protein of your interest and then use sequencing as your counter. So this is actually for all link. So kind of to wrap up actually the Illumina actual proportion. So um, once actually you can't prepare the library, you actually have to sequence it. So, so one of the things that really important is which sequencer that you need to do, you use. Again, each of these instruments, so I listed three instruments here, the MySeq, NixSeq, and the NovaSeq. There's kind of like the three main line, which is basically the benchtop model, low throughput, and then NixSeq is the uh, mid-level benchtop. And then NovaSeq is really your production scale. So you can see that even look at the throughput, um, you know, the amount of genome you can sequence is actually drastically different. Okay, so in terms of application, you know, my usually is for small panel or microbiome. Um, next thing, you can do a little bit of um, uh, 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 faster uh, whole genome, but mainly a lot of the time is actually at the targeted sequencing level or the uh, transcriptome level. And then for the NovaSeq, is really at the high frequent whole genome, large number of whole transcriptome, methylome, and a lot of counting actually is being done on the NovaSeq. Any question for Illumina before I move on? Yes. Is there any like Illumina protocol algorithm that you show that has to be better or more amenable to? Small amount of like, do, like is the quality of the DNA going in really the outcome? Yeah, it does. And uh, I will cover that a little bit more in the uh, in the second module, but definitely let's say, you know, that that's something, you know, all of us as you know, as pathologists really actually have to take into account of that. Um, there is definitely depends on like you know, I think there are products out there right now also to kind of address some of those situation but um but like you know I, I think some of those actually really requires a bit of like you know just calculation of maths actually for example I, I guess a question actually mid kind of mid lecture question for everyone how how much in terms of grams is one single human genome is it nanogram microgram level or beyond that one human genome Sorry? No, <laughs> one single copy of human genome is actually lower than that. It's actually six people. So think about it. So now what you want to do is when you kind of, um, you know, for those you already may have ex uh, experience in say extracting DNA, it's really actually now getting to calculating like how many genome equivalent that I might be using and actually pick the correct product to kind of address those. And also actually like say, you know, your avail availability of your samples, for example, right? You know, and also actually your, your, your research question. Um, do, you, do you do bulk or do you want to do actually like say at a single cell level? So, so that's, there's a lot, is a, is, a, is, a, is a question that there's a lot of potential answer to that, I think. But the one thing I think you really want to address is do you want to do bulk or single cell level? But also actually like say, what's the quantity of the materials you have available, especially for DNA, really actually use that genome equivalent. Kind of think about what you want to do actually. About this. Any other question? All right. So I think the next one is again. Give me a little bit of time to to uh, rest up my voice, and uh, we're going to look at uh, iron torrent. No, not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Actually, oh, it it it's still not yet. We we still have fifteen minutes actually. So. I'll go through my rest of the slide faster too.
Next generation sequencing is a powerful technology which can interrogate many targets at the same time, from just a few genes to all of the individual nucleotides and proteins. Next generation sequencing making it faster. The process is repeated every time the cell is repeated. It's the same nucleotide from the DNA strand and a complementary genome of the story. If the nucleotide is not complementary to the next phase, no ion is released, no voltage control is recorded, and no base is called. If there are two identical bases next to each other, two nucleotides are incorporated, the voltage doubles. Sorry? That's a, that's a question that I cannot openly assess it, and actually, I, we will take it actually on the break, I guess. I should saw that. But let's try to get to the break first. Um, so, again, um, I think to, to the most serious actually answer to your question will be actually what's the application? I think that's actually really actually where, where it's actually very important. So the, uh, the major difference between, as you know, the ion torrent and the illumin system is actually the illumin system is every incorporation of the base, there is a color that is actually associated with that. You're reading actually the color. Here, actually, it is actually, because it's called ion, it's actually really kind of uh, looking at the proton, the, uh, the H plus that is being released. Okay? So a couple of things actually really kind of, you don't want to think about is that it actually kind of get a faster runtime. So it, it actually really focuses more on the um, clinical application for fast turnaround. Um, the, the one thing is actually it cannot, for some reason, cannot scale it as much. So a lot of those uh, applications, um, as you can see in iron, is usually actually in the uh, targeted um, panel and, um, and fast turnaround panel, okay? So kind of just kind of, this is actually a repeat of the information shown in the, um, in the uh, video. The only one thing I want to kind of show you actually kind of interesting is that like, you know, it would basically every, every base incorporated um, for each, uh, each of the base, um, it will show a um, peak for the, the detecting the proton. The thing is actually is that you actually can detect two side by side, actually it's uh, a nucleotide, same nucleotide at the same time you have a double peak actually. So, so really there, there, there is that to actually kind of uh, things in there. Um, and um, and this is kind of like your you kind of roughly see this is how actually your kind of a 
kind of um, um, elect electric uh, 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 graph looks like that would convert into your uh, sequence. The other thing you want to think about, as you show in the video, is the beats that basically you start adding. Like your 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 DNA uh, uh, template is attached to a beat, and then you start adding the bases to it and detecting the iron um, um, uh, 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 release. It is really kind of like a single end method there in, in sort of actually Illumina is a, a pair and sequencing. And also at the same time, you know, you're doing so fast that, you know, and you can act, detect those kind of uh, enabling double, double T or double C uh, molecules. So they're not actually kind of synchronized. Actually, each worms are doing its own thing. And they actually, go, there's not like a uniformity actually in terms of the, uh, the read length actually proceeding. Library workflow file is very, very similar to uh, Illumina. I'm not going to go into too much detail in that. It's the same thing. You kind of have the DNA. You add adapters to them. You uh, uh, and then like uh, and then you amplify. You get actually your uh, DNA library. The one thing, I, as I mentioned, that the uh, Iron Turin really focus on a lot of the AmpliSeq um, uh, based protocol, which is the Amplicon based again. With a lot, because a lot of the assays are done with a lot of uh, FFP samples, low quantity, low quality too. So they actually use those actually um, um, uh, approach. Mm -hmm. And one of the one that you might heard a lot actually is the Oncomic series of tests. A lot of them are actually IVD tests. So there's a few um, options available. Um, as you can see, they are not as big as the Illumina sequencer. The biggest one, which is like the um, IN, IN S5 or, or Genesis, literally can only sequence actually a whole genome uh, uh, once. So, um, so a lot of their, their use is really for targeted sequencing um, and, and also for IVD tests. But you can see that their runtime is actually super fast. All, all of them actually are really runtime is less than uh, a day. All right, so we're gonna move into long read. Um, I'm gonna spend a few slides on long read. So we kind of compare Illumina with long read. So you got PacBio and Oxford Nanopore in here. Again, same thing, they are not amplifying your molecule. Um, to begin with, they are no PCL. PacBio is actually done also similar to Illuma is by sequence by synthesis. You're adding bases to a template to detect it, where actually Oxford Nanobot is sequencing direct detection through a um, through a um, electric uh, impedance. So why you want to study, uh, uh, use long read to study. So a couple of things that you can think about, um, characterizing complex uh, uh, genomics region, like repetitive elements, um, like you know, a lot of places where you have hundreds of bases of structures of repetitive element that really hard to use uh, short reads to kind of study. Structural uh, uh, variation, large scale genomics uh, re rearrangement, and also integrating native DNA. You know, you want to reduce the kind of like the PCR bias, but also there might be a modification of DNA that you can detect on some of these um, instruments. And then also for RNA, you want to look at actually like say transcript isophone and whatnot. Okay, so quickly actually in a, um, a, uh, sorry, oops. Do a um, nanopore uh, video. Was developed one of the best DNA known in sequencing technology designed to provide optimal biological information.
So that's the Oxford Nano Core. So again, I think one thing that in, in mentioned actually in the video is that it takes actually very, very quick actually to um, uh, generate libraries for those. Literally, you have a high molecular weight DNA and um, and then you you just um, kind of um, add, you know, you like gay actually adapter and the motor protein to that. And now you apply straight to the flow cell. That's kind of like your normal workflow. And they have also adapted protocol that you can actually go like extra long, as you can see it. Like it's kind of like a marathon. Actually, like they're trying to like you know a lot of the time race and say who which lab actually get the most uh, longest actually DNA uh, sequencing actually. So um, and they 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 usually run around uh, like you know seventy two hours actually every uh, uh, like yeah for each. Uh, uh, um, samples, but of course the other things with nanopore is really important. It's actually portable. So as you can see, for nanopore, it's just one single flow cell, same flow cell, no difference than any other. You can actually put it in a in a big normal instrument like the Promethean, um, which which basically is set in the lab, or you can take it actually with one of those actually a uh, portable one, which is the uh, Minion. Um, and you can actually take it like, you know, you've seen actually a, a, a video there actually, like they, they took it in the space or actually doing places for outbreak. So the really important thing for nanopore is really the, um, the you can do both long reads, um, our, our DNA, RNA, and also actually look at the native DNA, but also give you the, the chance actually to do a rapid uh, a portable actually, assay with that. I'm not gonna go into the uh, uh, N50 because this is actually kind of like the length, kind of like the, uh, the, the length, uh, of uh, average length that you can get, but uh, you can kind of read through that and we can actually um, uh, discuss that actually uh, on the side. I want to move to uh, the, the last one, actually, that I'm going to go in a little bit more detail, which is the PEC bio, which is single um, uh, molecule uh, real time sequencing. Um, I'm going to skip the video, we'll kind of go through actually kind of like uh, the, the, the workflow. So if you think about it, it's very similar to Illumina um, protocol. Um, what you start with is actually is a relatively larger fragment of DNA. Usually what you want to start up with actually DNA of around 15 to 20 kilobases. So your extraction needs to kind of adjust to that. And what you do is you, you add uh, adapter, which basically is a, a, a kind of like a dumbbell that you add to both ends. And now you have a big piece actually that is closed, uh, DNA double-stranded at both ends with actually about 15 to um, uh, 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 20 uh, uh, thousand uh, um, nucleotide in there. And what you do is that you they actually have each of these molecules go and get a single molecule go into their special well called the ZAP NW. And, and then from there on, they can detect small amount of uh, of fluorescence up. So it's the same thing, kind of like you learn by actually sequencing by synthesis, but they actually kind of like detect in a much more sensitive way. And what you do is this kind of um, this template now kind of got opened up into a big circle, and your DNA polymerase start keep kind of synthesizing here uh, over and over and over again through those 20,000 uh, base pair. And you kind of be able to line that up and give you actually highly kind of fidelity uh, reads actually with that. So again, the product is very, very similar to Illumina uh, in terms of actually the, uh, the library workflow. The one thing with Pack Bio is actually is that like, um, I think it's getting better and better into the cost of the sequencing and the throughput. Uh, SQL 2 was the last generation. It can actually be able to do like say about um, uh, um, 8 million uh, uh, molecule at a time. And the newest one uh, with uh, Ravio that actually uh, we have a couple actually here in Toronto. You can go over actually 360 gigabytes actually a day uh, with increased uh, throughput. And now really at the production level, you're getting around actually maybe like a 20X uh, genome at around $2,000. Uh, uh, for a long read sequence, which is not bad. 
Um, the the um, in terms of actually one of the things that um, PacBio is really good at is really um, uh, isoformer sequencing for the RNA. So really, actually using actually the, the, the approach to look at a lot of different RNA fusion. Last week, before I wrap up this section, I just want to bring your attention to a couple of newer technologies um, uh, um, that is actually in the market. Some of them actually may not may not even actually be totally commercialized yet. The first one is actually Element Bioscience. Um, they have an instrument called Aviti, and it's kind of like a NixSeq. So it's actually competing directly to NixSeq. But the one thing actually it, it has is actually, and, and the chemistry is very, very similar to Illumina. The very, very important thing though is actually they are trying to sell the, um, the, the, the genome at around $200 a genome, where at the next thing level, you're probably paying around $4,000 actually. So it's quite significant drop in price. The way that they do it is actually they're in-house. Um, the company was started by Illumina scientists and they basically engineer protein that uh, give it a better detection of the uh, signal. And that's actually where we can, they can get that. The very interesting thing is they already put around 300 units out there in the field. So hopefully they are getting actually more and more traction. Uh, there's, I think, a couple actually in Canada. Um, the other thing that's interesting is they are the first company that actually do um, capture target sequencing directly on the flow cell. So instead of doing it in a test strip, they actually put the capture probe on the flow cell and then sequence it. So that's a new, that actually just came out last week. Um, it's kind of very, very interesting to kind of pay attention to. And then the last one is ultimate genomics. This is really competing against the, the bread and butter of Illumina, which is the high throughput sequencing. This company is um, using a wafer-based um, contact spin coding technology. It's actually, it's like a kind of like a DVD or CD that you go put, put your DNA on and then get sequence. It's super fast and also super efficient. Uh, it could literally go down to around hundred dollars actually for genomes. This is a company that doesn't have a real um, uh, instrument placed yet out there that someone purchased, but they did have a number of uh, beta models uh, already uh, installed at uh, places like Broad, um, uh, New York Genomes, and uh, Macrogenome is one of the big uh, Korean company doing genome sequencing. So really actually a, a potential competitor Illumina, and they, they claim to have actually much higher um, uh, quality and uh, potentially actually used for actually liquid biopsies. All right, the last two slides of uh, this, this module, just kind of want to kind of link it back, the technology back to um, maybe an application like a cancer care, especially a lot of, a lot of your uh, pathologists. So really, if you think about it, that currently, if you think about the common genetic tests available for cancer care are really at the single gene test level, maybe actually like a KRAS testing or a, um, a, a BRCA testing or the gene panel testing. And the availability of whole genome testing is really outside of our current uh, healthcare system. But as you see, the cost of actually uh, sequencing is getting now to that level that we should start thinking about implementing it at the kind of like at the healthcare level. So the some, some of the common panel testing is like you know things like Oncomine, TrueSeq 500, TSO 500 is actually the normal one that's being used. But the other thing actually, what, what you want to see is that there is actually more what you call the companion diagnostic. Again, we can start like a whole, whole discussion on that, but um, just to kind of define companion uh, diagnostic is that these are the type of tests that use um, to help match a patient to a specific drug or therapy. So for example, a companion diagnostic can identify a patient tumor has a specific gene change or biomarker that's targeted by specific drugs. So. Most of the time, what you see is actually is that your drug has to be FDA approved, but also at the same time, your companion diagnostic test, whether it's a QPCR test, but more importantly for our kind of context, a NGS test is also needed to be um, FDA approved so that they can be a true companion diagnostic drug that in the US that can be basically reimbursable. So if you go and look at actually common um, onco, uh, oncogene uh, uh, database, so here actually I'll show you I'm not expecting you to see anything like in terms of uh, 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 fonts there, but this basically I take the whole list of um, companion diagnostic tests and the drug from OncoKV, the most common uh, Onco uh, gene case, uh, database. Here, it does look like a lot, but if you think about that, it's actually only like say less than actually like say between 50 to 100 lines. It's actually not a lot if you think about treatment for all the different types of cancer, right? So it in in fact if you kind of, kind of kind of a condensed, you know, 
it's only cover about 10 cancer type. There may be one or two that is actually more pan cancer. Only 30 genes are being covered. And at most, actually, there's like around 10 assays. And these are mainly targeted assay. And so the point here is actually there's still a lot to be done. And, and I, I think that that's, that's for us is actually the exciting part is actually is that, you know, um, it is actually linking everything together. Like, you know, now there's a drugs, but now we can really kind of find ways through genomics to really help match patients to that. And I'm really looking forward to the next five, 10 years where there's more tests available and, and kind of be able to match more patients to drugs. And just kind of one thing that you want to think about, you know, maybe even invest in these companies, like major players in this is actually things like uh, Foundation Medicine, pretty much I think a lot of you may know, they got bought by Roche and they, their Foundation One CDX or Foundation Liquid CDX is like the major kind of a panel based approach. Um, but there are other companies like Garden, Garden 360, another one that's very common. From Fisher, Uncle Mine, and um, Myriad actually also have some products actually for that. So yeah, I think that will wrap up the first section. Um, it was just slightly over time, maybe five, 10 minutes, but any questions?